surprise view. Dust as we are, the immortal spirit grows. From the prelude, William Wordsworth. Early evening, but it's dark already, a winter's night. A wine bar in Soho, and a man sits nursing a balloon glass of red wine, who was once an English teacher, and is now a banker. A woman comes in, lots of men and women come in, but he's waiting for this one. He stands and smiles, pulls out a chair for her. She gives him a light kiss on both cheeks. He seems preoccupied, sad even, but he puts on a brave face and greets her with affection. Sorry I'm late, she says, hand on his shoulder. No problem, Helen. I had my friends to keep me company. He nods at the wine glass and Helen sees the bottle that stands beside it, two-thirds empty. He sees her looking. I'll get another bottle. But she puts up a hand. No, I'm fine with that. She points to the remains of the wine. She's probably thinking that her having some will stop him drinking it all himself. They both sit. After a minute, she says softly, The wine. He sighs and shrugs. I know. I know it's been hard. I don't mean to nag, but alcohol is a medicine that turns into a poison. She's a psychiatrist, works for the South London and Maudsley Hospital Trust, working with patients who abuse alcohol and drugs. He smiles. You're my big sister. You're just looking out for me. He pours her a glass of wine and finishes the bottle himself, filling his glass with an apologetic but insincere smile. How have you been? she asks kindly. So-so. She places her hand on top of his. I'm so sorry, I can't even imagine. His mouth goes tight. Neither could I, but I don't have to imagine now. He thinks he's being self-pitying and forces a smile, realises that's inappropriate. Then his face falls into emptiness. He wears an expression that neither expresses his feelings nor hides them. Helen says, She was lovely. It's so sad. Sad for both of them. Of course, she says softly. For both of them. The funerals are now over. Brother and sister know what happened well enough, so instead they talk about his plans for Christmas. You're coming to ours, David, Helen says firmly. He grimaces. I think I'll just go away somewhere on my own. I don't want to be at home. Please, Mike's looking forward to talking to you about football. It's the only male company he gets. David rubs his eyes. I don't know. Silence. Helen thinks about the family Christmas. David thinks about the wind and the rain and the dark skies full of clouds. He winces. It's just, I think I'd be better on my own. She purses her lips. I'm not sure you would. In the night outside, a whirl of snowflakes blows along Greek Street. David watches as in the yellow streetlight, they twist, whirl and melt. He lifts his glass to his lips, sips. His sister watches him. He says, I was thinking of Cumbria. The Lake District? Yes, near Keswick, Borodale Valley. Among strangers. Strangers soon become friends. She used to say that. Two days before Christmas, David has his room in the Borodale Hotel booked for a Christmas and New Year package. He doesn't know if he'll stay for New Year, but you had to book it that way. Today he's walking up to Watt Endleth. The air is crisp and cold with the clouds that coloured the soft white that forecasts snow. David trudges up through the woods, crunching ice in the puddles. All around are moss-covered rocks and the trees, pine, oak and ash. A squirrel darts above him from branch to branch. He hardly catches a glance of it, but thinks it was a red. A sudden break in the tree shows the Derwent Fells to his left. He's nearly at Ashnest Bridge now. When he gets to the old stone bridge, there's a mountain goat bus stopped and a cargo of visitors, Chinese, Japanese, Indian and Mancunians, are smiling and taking snaps of themselves on the stone arch, the most photographed bridge in the Lake District. The beck froths and frets, plunging down between rocks all the way to the lake below. A glance up shows Derwent water, and beyond... Skidor looming iced in snow like a huge stolen cake. Beautiful, but it still can't take the grief away. His wife was killed while driving at speed to see their son who'd been rushed into hospital with viral meningitis. It was a double funeral. She was on her own because he was still at work, making money. Money, 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 lots of money. Enough money to buy the moon, maybe, but not enough to bring you back the ones you love. The ones you love and have now gone where you can never see them again. And then David re-enters the woods. The trees stand bare-leaved and stark in the still winter air, 
trunk after trunk after trunk, mesmerizing. David walks through the trees and is surprised by the view. Surprised view. It's aptly named. The naked apron of rock is a popular beauty spot. It overlooks the lake far below and stands opposite the mountains across an echo of cold air. Beautiful, but it still doesn't take the biting, numbing grief away. The view of the trees just brings memories. The sound of the wind just brings memories. The smell of the damp earth just brings memories. And they were never even here, never in Cumbria. That's why he chose to come here. Never here, and not anywhere now. David leaves the lake view and walks on, again lost in the trees, trudging over gravel and ice. His breath comes out in clouds. And then the snow begins to fall. Not heavily, just a fluttering, just the touch of soft flakes that come spiralling down through the trees, landing on fallen branches and clumps of moss, dusting them with such delicacy, half melting, half remaining. Soft, soft, soft the gentle caress of the snow on his face. The air becomes confiding and cold, wrapping the woods in silence. There's nobody here now. The tourists, like his wife and son, have gone. There's just his own breath, the feel of his heart in his chest, and the soft sound of his boots on the forest floor. He stands alone, the last man on earth. And then he sees the stag. It's seen him first, of course, standing fifty yards away. The magnificent beast, shaggy red-brown with five tines on his antlers, watches him quietly. The stag stares impassively and David meets its stare. The black of the animal's eye draws him in. The world stops spinning. For a brief epiphany moment, the man, the stag, the universe are one. And David knows he's made from the same stuff as the stag, as the wood, as the wind itself. A line from Wordsworth's prelude comes unexpectedly into David's head. I had melancholy thoughts, a strangeness in my mind, a feeling that I was not for that hour, nor for that place. The reverie is suddenly broken. The stag scents something and lifts its head and looks into the wood, a flutter of snow between him and it now. The stag breaks into a trot and disappears further into the forest. David stands quietly still transfixed by what he has just seen and felt. From behind, he hears the sound of a horn, as if from far away. Riders appear. Slowly they emerge from some dream of winter long ago. The horsemen pick their way through the trees, the clip-clump of horses' hooves, their snorts and billowing clouds of breath. Men and beasts look ghostly in the falling snow, like the companions of King Arthur or John Peel. There are women on some of the horses. They come close, but don't speak, drifting like spectres through the wood, the snow falling on them, not enough to settle, but enough to land on cheeks and eyelashes. The riders go on in silence, the dogs trotting by the horses, and then a woman speaks from behind. She's mounted on a chestnut horse with a white blaze on its nose. David turns, startled by her sudden appearance as she appears like a spirit from between the dark, bold trees. I didn't mean to surprise you. The woman's well-spoken, the accent's standard English, not the northern that they speak round here. David says, Are you one of the hunters? He's prepared to get into an argument. The woman has long grey hair pulled back in a ponytail. Her face is high-cheeked and she must be in her sixties, if not older. Her eyes, pale brown, look down on him, a ghost of a smile on her face. No, I don't ride with the hunt, she says. But you're on horseback. A smile broadens. It's not against the law. Something about her challenges him, and he still wants to argue. He's still angry. Isn't it dangerous riding among the trees with all these rocks and fallen branches? The horse knows his way. There's nothing offensive about the woman, but rage boils in David's chest. The unfairness of her being so serene and him feeling like all his skin is cut away. He's prepared to shout about hunting, though she's no hunter. It's just a coincidence that she's riding in the wood, but it's crazy riding in a wood. She should know better. The woman goes on. I live near here with my husband. He's a doctor. David waits. He doesn't know what to say. He wishes she'd leave. But then she says, as if she'd been working up her courage, there is always forever, you know. David's irritable, unaccountably so. And the woman rides on, 
and he watches her go. He loses sight of her amongst the trees, as strange departing words echo in his head. Later, he passes a house. It's old, made of Lakeland slate. It's called Grey Crag, and looks like it could belong to a doctor and a posh lady who rides horses through the woods. A Christmas tree glistens in the window, red and white with blue lights, gold tinsel twined among dark green needles, a golden star gleaming on the very top. David walks on. Back at the bar after his walk, he feels the glow of the fire. Standing there, he orders a bottle of wine. Two glasses, the barman asks. One will be fine. Then he takes the bottle and the glass and finds a table near the open fire, roasting his face in the heat. It feels good. It's the only thing that feels good. The fire, and maybe the wine. But he drinks it too fast to taste it. It's an insult to an excellent wine to be gulped like this, but the liquor takes away his memories and his grief. For a while, at least. At least until 2 a.m. when he'll roll awake as if he's never slept, sweating from alcohol, weeping from a heartbreak never to be fixed. David stares into the fire, glass in his fist. A man appears next to him. Mind if I sit here? David grunts. No, it's instinctive, but he looks around. There are other tables, but they're all occupied. People are arriving for dinner, having a drink in the bar first. Are you having dinner? The man asks. He looks to be around seventy, dressed in a tweed jacket with leather patches at the elbows, short grey hair, glasses, and a grey moustache. David nods at his wine glass. That. Oh dear, says the man, overstepping the bounds of politeness. Those unwritten rules meant to keep strangers from commenting on your behaviour, no matter how self-destructive. Sorry, the man says, extending a hand. David pauses, then unclamps his fist from the wine glass and limply shakes the proffered hand. David Pete, he says. The older man smiles. John Hand, he nods at the wine. Used to be my business, health. I'm a retired GP. David says, my sister works in the field, with addictions, down in London. Ah, up here on holiday? Sort of. With your family? I don't have any family. It could have meant anything, but the doctor knows it instantly. He's gentle. Sorry. David looks back at his wine. You didn't know. It's not your fault. The doctor goes silent, and David, sensing the unspoken question, says, I had a son. He was 18. He died. And my wife died around the same time. I'm very sorry to hear that. Again, not your fault. He takes another mouthful of wine. There is no time, you know. Nothing is lost if you look with your heart rather than your eyes. Really? David pushes his hand through his hair. What does that even mean? The doctor meets his eye. I lost my wife in a riding accident. I'm sorry to hear that, David says. He's staring into the fire now. She shouldn't have been riding there. I often told her. When she went, my heart broke. I didn't know what to do. I even sold the house. I couldn't bear to be there without her. I came and moved in here. David raises an eyebrow. To this hotel? Dr. Hand nods. I've been here ever since. Must cost you a fortune. I knew the original owner. He's dead now. But we had an arrangement, and I was fortunate enough that money was no object at the time. Nor to me, but it doesn't help, does it? Dr. Hand shakes his head sadly and looks kindly at David. He goes on. I came to see that all time is eternally present. All of our memories, all of those we have loved, are as close to us as a whisper. We just don't perceive them. Nothing needs to be saved, because nothing is lost. David says softly, It's kind of you to say that. I appreciate you trying to comfort me. But I feel so alone. I feel I've lost them forever. That they're gone. And I'm here alone forever. But that can't be so, Hans says. Don't you see? David shakes his hand and sinks into reverie. When he looks up again, the doctor has gone. Christmas Eve. No snow, but it's a bright, frosty morning. The desk clerk says, Another walk today, Mr. Pete. You'll be very fit. David says, I'll be back for dinner. For some reason, he slept better last night. And he feels lighter than he has since his wife and son died. At first that seems like a betrayal, but he knows they wouldn't want him sad, wherever they are. He walks a different way round. At last he finds himself in the wood where he saw the stag. He stands a while looking out for it, 
the memory of their shared moment together still fresh in his mind's eye, but the stag does not return. At surprise view, he stops to gaze at the mountains and the lakes. You can see up the chain of valleys all the way to Scotland, clear and bright over the narrow sea. He feels strikingly, blindingly alone. But now it matters less. He's alone, but somehow not alone. Something the doctor said has struck home. Nothing needs to be saved, because nothing is truly lost. And then he walks again. He's lost in the mystery of the woods. The trees crowd round him, and once again he feels the silence as if he's wrapped in it. He comes across the house, grey crag, still blazing with its Christmas tree in the window. He wonders if that's where Dr. Hand used to live. And then he sees the lady on the chestnut horse with the blaze. She's coming through the woods, and again he thinks how dangerous it must be to take a horse over this rough terrain. Horse and rider reach the side of the house, and David steps back into the shadows so she won't see him. He wants to see where she's going. She goes round the side of the house, but before she disappears, she dismounts. She gets off the horse and clasps its reins in her gloved hand. David thinks this must be where she lives, in this old house, deep in the woods, far away from everybody, and he believes it would be a wonderful place to live, with its beautiful Christmas tree burning in the window, like hope. But she knows he's watching. She raises a silent hand in greeting, and he waves back. Back at the hotel, it's time for dinner. David stands at the bar. The barman, who has a face like creased leather and looks like he's been working behind that bar for a thousand years, asks, Usual bottle, Mr. Pete? David is about to say yes. The barman reaches to fetch a fresh bottle. But David stops him. Just a glass tonight, I think. The barman nods and fills a glass from a bottle of house red that's already open. David runs his finger round the base of the glass, but he doesn't pick it up. The barman says, Walked anywhere nice today? Just round the fells and then back through what endless woods. That's a nice walk. David says, Yes, I saw a lovely Christmas tree in the window of the house up there. The barman raises an eyebrow. In the woods? I didn't know there was a house in the woods. Yes, a grey crag. It's a grand old building. The barman shakes his head. No, it can't have been grey crag. Oh, why not? That old house is a ruin. It's been empty for twenty years. The roof's in and all. David grunts. Really? I just wondered if it had belonged to Dr. Hand, the fellow that moved in here when his wife died. Dr. Hand, Dr. John Hand. Yes, that's him. The barman gives a surreptitious look at the wine glass in David's hand, still untouched. Finally, he patiently explains. You can't have met Dr. Hand. David frowns, but I did, here, last night. The barman says, he was here when I first came, lived here for a couple of years. I believe his wife was thrown from a horse in the woods. He couldn't live in the house after that and left it. David remembers the woman rider. That is strange, but the story was the one the doctor told him. He asks, well, if he doesn't live here anymore, he must live nearby because he was in this bar with me last night. The barman says firmly, Dr. Han died over 15 years ago. I know because I went to his funeral at the little church in the valley. And then David remembers what the doctor had said. Nothing is lost. Everything is eternally present if you just look with your heart, not your eyes. The dead do return. The hotel manager passes. No rush, he says, but I've got the Christmas Day menu if you want to choose. David smiles. The manager listens while David says, No thanks, you've been wonderfully kind, but I'm going back down to London to spend Christmas with my sister and her family. He leaves the wine untouched. But thou art with us, with us in the past, the present, with us in the times to come. There is no grief, no sorrow, no despair, no languor, no dejection, no dismay. No absence scarcely can there be for those who love as we do. William Wordsworth Hi, uh, this is Tony Walker from the Classic Ghost Stories podcast. You've just heard Surprise View, which is a story from my uh, More Christmas Ghost Stories collection. You may be listening to this in June or August 2023, or you may be in the Southern Hemisphere and enjoying a Christmas which is red hot in your bikini on the beach, if you have a beach and a bikini. Um, I have a beach not too far away, but I don't have a bikini. But anyway... 
I wouldn't go now because it's really, really cold. It's raining and it's cold. It's not snowing though. But enough of that. So Surprise View is a story I did for that collection and I wrote it about a year ago and it's set in the Lake District very close to not too far from where I live, a bit further away as now as I've moved a little bit further away. It is a real place, Surprise View. It's a fantastic view. You come across it by surprise and suddenly the whole of the lake and the mountains are revealed to you. So it's a very special place. Part of the story comes from when I was a little boy. We were collecting wood and in, in, in a wood, in a forest, to take to the old folk in the town where I lived so it was a uh, I was in the air cadets because I wanted to be a, a pilot when I was younger but then I discovered I was colorblind but I didn't know that at the time and anyway we we're in this wood uh, and it was near Christmas because we were doing it for Christmas and suddenly um, a hunt appeared now this is a controversial subject and they don't typically wear red jackets in Cumbria and they tend to be foot packs so they don't tend to be a horse horse mounted um, but in my memory I was in the wood and the hunt comes through the wood with their red jackets and their dogs and their horses and the um, the snow falling on them and so I suppose that's where that image comes from. Uh, the image of the stag is because in that very wood, not very far along the cliff edge, we saw this wonderful stag once with huge tines on its uh, on its antlers uh, and it was pretty magnificent. So. Um, and the only other thing to say, there are lots of, you know, when you you live a life and you write a story, you borrow little bits from it. And uh, Dr. John Hand was, in fact, my dad, uh, who was um, a doctor, but he wasn't an English GP. He was a Scottish uh, nephrologist. He was a kidney specialist. So, uh, but, you know, you know, you've got to bend the truth a little bit sometimes. And he was never married to a woman who died uh, falling off a horse um, in a wood up there but you borrow things anyway that's a little bit about the story the, the Borrowdale Hotel is real um, it's a place where you used to go for high tea sometimes some um, actually very very rarely but I have very fond memories of sitting there in this old Victorian like um, sitting room with tea with silver pots and hot milk and shortbread you know I think probably we only went about once or twice, but I have memories. And I do remember seeing deer in those woods a few times. So um, it is Christmas. This has been a fantastic year for the Classic Ghost Stories podcast. And I wanted to thank you for listening and watching, depending how you consume the podcast, either on YouTube or on your favourite podcast app, or even as audiobooks, because you can get a number of the stories through Audible these days. So thank you very much. I, When I started um, writing, I've always written, but uh, I started publishing my stories in about 2015, initially science fiction and things like that. Uh, I'd always been interested in ghost stories, so, and I have a history as a ghost hunter, and uh, anyway, lots of things like that. But so, this, and there's a funny story about a psychic who, in about 1990, told me the spirits would give me a golden pen. So, there you go. I didn't know what she was talking about then, and uh, maybe this is what she's talking about. So, I started publishing my own stories uh, because nobody else would publish them because they seemed to think they were rubbish. But you've got to believe in your own work, really. And I've come to realise at my grand old age that what somebody says is good is just a matter of opinion. Um, some of the music and books I and movies that I love, other people don't think much of, and vice versa. Some of the things that they rave about leave me cold. So it is cl completely a matter of opinion. And the modern age allows anybody to find an audience if they're persistent enough and so I would say keep on at it. Um, I first published, first published, first produced the Classic Ghost Stories podcast about three years ago, I think it was September 2019 and I kept on going, I just kept on going, kept on going every week, sometimes more. We put out stories, now it helped that I liked telling the stories to people and it helped and I was getting a, a reaction because I think if you're getting no response from an audience for a long time that can be really hard but with things like podcasts and YouTube it is possible to get a, a response from people not everybody's going to like what you do but 
you know, if enough people do, it can be inspiring to keep you going. So um, that's what happened to me. And from nowhere, with the Patreons I have, and with the ad revenue from YouTube, uh, and some money from the Audible, uh, yeah, no, not not nothing from the Audible um, audiobooks, um, I've actually probably almost got a living, um, a modest living, but nevertheless, you know, and that is amazing. And again, it's thanks to you. It's thanks to people who like the work, who spread the word, you great ambassadors. Not only do you listen and enjoy, but you spread the word and that helps grow. And that really benefits me. So uh, we have a deal. Uh, you keep liking what I do and I'll keep producing it. There we are. So thank you again. Thank you very much. Merry Christmas um, or whatever holiday it happens to be when you're listening to this. As I say, um, thank you. Okay. Thank you.